All right. Hello, everyone. My name is David Wu. I am the CEO and founder of Modus Nova, um, and I want to welcome you to another edition of your Rehab Power Hour. This is your community to engage in virtual rehab together and a place to discuss all things neuro rehab from the science, the people behind it, and the individual journeys of recovery. Uh, as always, we welcome anyone recovering from a neurological injury, um, their friends or care partners and families uh, to join us live and have the opportunity to engage in this conversation. Um, if you have any questions or comments, please submit them to rehabpowerhour at modusnova.com or post them here in the live chat and I'll do my best to answer them. Um, if you, also, we have a phone line actually. Uh, you can call in and uh, we can kind of play your question on the air. And number for that is 404 594 4244. And if you find this helpful, please hit like and share with your friends and join our uh, support group on, on Facebook. It really helps us get the word out there um, and, and uh, supports us doing more of, of these rehab power hours. Very good. And so tonight, um, I'm excited to announce uh, some, some uh, uh, more, of, uh, more users joining our 30-hour challenge club. Um, we have here uh, uh, Michael Williams. Uh, we have Mike, uh, William Fowler and Sharon Moore all having completed their 30 hour challenge. So congrats to them. Uh, we'll have to get you guys um, the t-shirts the that we're sending out uh, here shortly. Um, be, out, be on the lookout for that. Uh, we'll have to get everyone's uh, t-shirt sizes to make sure that, that we get um, uh, everyone uh, there, the, the 30 hour challenge uh, uh, achievers, their, their champion t-shirts. Um, so we'll have to get that swag out there. Um, shortly and, and be, be, out to, be out on the lookout, lookout from us uh, for email for that. Very good. And so tonight I want to start, um, well, we're going to start with a special segment here. Um, but first I want to introduce uh, Maddie. Uh, Maddie Niebank is a stroke survivor um, and uh, she's going to be uh, joining us tonight. Um, and later on, she'll come on to show us a little bit about uh, how she puts on her hand mentor, um, Maddie, uh, uh, welcome to the show. Hi, thank you so much. Yes, yeah, so excited to be here. Um, yes, I'm a stroke <laughs> and I am an avid user of the Hand Mentor. Very good. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll have to go through, uh, you had an incredible story as well, Maddie. So we'll have to um, talk about that here in the second half of our show. Um, but uh, first we have a, another special guest with me tonight. Um, Dr. Stephen Wolf. Um, uh, uh, Dr. Wolf has been uh, among many, many accolades, um, had a, a, a incredible career in, um, uh, in the research of uh, stroke and stroke rehabilitation. Uh, among his uh, um, many uh, awards, he's uh, been named a living, uh, the Living Legend Lifetime Achievement Award uh, from the American Physical Therapy Association. Um, and uh, his, his bio is, is too long for, for me to kind of uh, 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 to go through here uh, tonight in our, in our short time. Um, but uh, welcome to the show, Dr. Wolf. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. <laughs> um, great um, to see you. Project for a second. Dr. Please, Wolf, Maddie. you are literally a celebrity. I have done the Wolf, the Wolf motor assessment, whatever it's called, so many times. And it's, so it's really crazy. <laughs> to have this opportunity to actually talk with you. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, I, I'm, you're smiling when you say that, so I guess that's a good thing. <laughs> uh, I mean, I'll be honest, the Wolf motor assessment is not my favorite thing. And my honest feedback is some of the stuff is weight. It, it goes from like the things that are super easy, easy, like elbow extension or, you know, you know, moving your arm. And then it's like, all of a sudden, oh, turn this key in a lock. It's like, <laughs> way too hard. like I'm never going to be able to do that. Yes. Maybe I can like move, extend my elbow and do those things. But there's like, I just wish that there were a couple more activities that were more that. In well, the well, 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 I think that's something we're going to talk about tonight, Maddie. And, and Hey, never say never. Right. Um, you know, never that's, that's never. part of that's that's part of our journey here um you know uh that's something that we can't do today maybe um but uh yes. um that's something that that certainly we want to work towards and and yeah so so dr wolf uh welcome to the to the show and welcome back i should say um and uh, that's maybe something that we wanted to uh, uh to talk to you tonight about 
um, the Wolf uh, Motor Function Test. Um, it's a it's an upper extremity uh, assessment for the, the hand and the arm. And and tonight maybe we wanted to chat with you, um, you know, from from uh, um, uh, the uh, namesake from Dr. Wolf himself. Um, kind of what led up to um, the the creation of this test, um, and uh, um, kind of uh, 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 hearing from you, um, you know, what what it's what it's been, um, uh, how how has it affected. Um, you think uh, uh, the way that uh, we kind of use this and we treat stroke survivors um, and, and, and uh, how, yeah, the impacts of, of, of it. So maybe we can start at the beginning. Um, I know that we have, we're chatting a little bit before the show about this. Um, uh, what, what factors led up to you uh, creating a, a um, or thinking about even the beginnings of creating um, um, a new test? Okay, well, thank you, David. And, and, and Maddie, I appreciate your honesty. And perhaps some of what I'm about to say will make sense to you. Okay. Um, uh, it's very difficult to come up with a series of measures that accommodates every degree of impairment that folks with head strokes can demonstrate. And believe it or not, some of the more simplistic ones that, which are actually being shown, or will be shown in a video in a few moments, I think, um, are difficult for some people to do and very easy for other folks to do. So these gradations of tests and measures are designed to, to, to determine just what any stroke survivor can do and cannot do. The, the answer to the question, I was concerned that some of these movements um, that people have been using up to that point uh, did not take into account the ability for us to isolate motions at single joints and then try to put the entire group of joints together in functionally based tasks that can be measured in time and quality of movement. And so many years ago, I sat down with a group of vocational rehabilitation counselors. Vocational rehabilitation counselors are specialists whose job it is to identify what possible job work reorientation mm. can be done for someone who's had a stroke or a head injury, given what the um, amount of their impairments are and what their capabilities are. And so with that in mind, I sat down many, many years ago with a whole group of them and I said, okay, tell me about some of the things you look for. What, what makes, helps you make a decision about what you think a, a stroke survivor would be best adept at being able to do based upon their movement capabilities. And they started going through a whole list of tasks and vocations. And I thought, well, what I need to do here is to string this together in a sequence that makes sense and that yeah. uh, we can measure. We also put a time limit on these, as, as you know. Yeah. We argue that if a person could not do a task within two minutes, they probably can't do it at all. So there's a ceiling placed upon those. So I imagine there were many, many more, uh, uh, you know, functions or tasks than than that you might have time for to to put into the test. Yeah. How how did you go about? Uh, maybe talk to us a little bit about how you decided um, which functions, which movements to test for, and which ones um, to kind of leave out. Well, I think part of the, the the driving decisions are based upon time. What can one practically do in a reasonable amount of time that does not fatigue out a, a patient, can be done within the clinic, uh, can be validated against another measure, um, and um, will uh, then can be, be tested and for which we could develop a normative yeah. database. By that, I mean, what would you expect a person to be able to do with both their dominant and non-dominant upper extremity? And so those were the considerations. Then we asked ourselves, can we come up with an equal distribution of tasks that are simplistic, single joints, like bringing your hand from mm. your lap to a table, either sitting in front of the table or to the side of the table, and then up onto a box, which requires more control and elevation and movement. Yeah. And then start moving down to the elbow joint with and without resistance, and ultimately to hand activities and then finally to activities that require coordination of the entire upper extremity, all of which one could 
I think, reasonably say there's a relationship between what you're asking someone to do on these tests and what they would have to do in real life. So something that appears as simple as bringing your hand from your lap to a table or to a box are the first phases of what would have to be done in a reaching task to reach out to grasp something. So it's the simple pieces that will go into the larger puzzle because that's how we train patients very often therapeutically. Yeah. You can't do the entire, unless you're really, really good and very, very, very mildly impaired, you can't do a lot of these tasks straight away. You have to relearn to do them into components. Yeah. So we came up time. with what, what it basically amounts to 15 timed tasks. We call that the Emory Motor Test. One of my colleagues added a qualitative aspect of movement, how well and, and smoothly one can do each task on a five point scale and we call the functional ability scale and put the two together, started applying it to a few patients and lo and behold, published this paper called the Wolf Motor Function Test <laughs> without ever asking me to use my name. And, and, and once it was out there, that was, that was it. And, and I guess since that time, um, that test is now used quite a bit. Um, I think uh, the last time I checked, there are over 600 referee publications that use this as an outcome measure. Wow, yeah. And it's been validated, uh, com compared favorably to other outcome measures. So it stands the test of time, includes all the motions and components that are, are required to do any one of a fun series of functional tasks. Maddie referred to trying to pick your arm up, put your fingertips on a key, and turn a lock in one direction and in another direction. That's that so requires, it's hard because, Maddie, it requires every single motion control of the upper extremity. <laughs> Shoulder flexion, elbow extension, grasping, rotation in each direction of the wrist joint. Yeah. That's and very I, I think hard. here we have, but we have a video of it here as That's well. Right. There it is. We have a right video there. of it here yeah, as well. Yeah, the, 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 the dreaded key portion, I think it is. Yeah, so that's some. Um, that's like impossible. No, not impossible. Well, I've heard, I've had many patients say it's impossible um, until they do it. Exactly. And even this gentleman, if you look carefully, he's, he's struggling to do it. He has a hard time in the grasp. He's yeah. going to be able to turn. He's kind of rotating, rotating his body. And when he first started to turn that, it wasn't straightforward turning. He would actually turn his entire body to try to do it. And using the weight of his whole trunk, make the motion right mm -hmm. and he learns he learned with more skill training of his hand and wrist to do it in isolation so the answer to the question is all of these tasks are chosen because they represent a progressive use of all of the joints of the upper extremity in a way that we know would have to be used functionally I'm going to pick up a can to drink um, here's a bilateral the only bilateral task folding a towel requires control over symmetrical, equal control over both hands to do it successfully. And then rotating, turning the towel in half, he gets to do it one way with his more impaired right hand. And then another way, with left. and that's hard for him, very hard for him to grasp. So you can see he's got some movement in his fingers, but not enough to hold it in control. And that's mm -hmm. what the therapist will be working on. So the value added to this test is it helps the therapists identify what they have to work on functionally with the patient to try to improve those activities. Yeah, no, I, I think that that, um, that that kind of knowing that history that it kind of came from some of the earlier inspirations was from that, uh, from some vocational uh, kind of uh, matching um, that background, that kind of it, it speaks to the, maybe the items that are in, in, this, uh, in the test. Um, I know the, there's a the shopping basket as well, uh, but um, always, I was always curious as to how some of these items ended up in the test, uh, in the in the Wolf Motor Function test, and and how some of them, um, you know, uh, and and of course there are other upper extremity tests that involve cricket balls, um, sharpening stones, um, yeah. blocks. Of course, are very common, uh, but it's al always an interesting story to hear how some of some of these items end up. Um, being selected. And, and certainly, you know, for, for all of our viewers out there, please uh, jump in the comments if you, if you ever um, yourself have, uh, 
have conducted or have, have done, I should say, uh, the, the Wolf Motor Function Test as part of your rehab or part of your assessment. Um, and, and Dr. Wolf here, I'm, I'm sure um, you'll, be, you'll be pleased to know that it's, that it's been helping a lot of stroke survivors kind of, and clini their clinicians as well, I should say, like yeah. uh, um, with figuring just, out uh, what part of the journey they're on. I just think it's important to know that I mean, these are just made up tests. These are based upon what professionals who have to help find jobs for folks yeah. who have had disabilities of their upper extremity after a stroke. Um, and they told us, well, you need to test a person's ability to do A, B, C, or D. And these are the kinds of things we look for to make decisions. And that's how these, te these selected tests came about. It wasn't, let's just make up something. It was a, a method to the madness underlying it. There's that's another right. test called a Jepson Taylor hand function test. And some of the components that we use are very similar to what they use, except I honestly believe our test is a little harder. And that's quite deliberate. We can't, if we made it so easy, it yeah. has to have relationship to what you can do functionally and what you can't do so that we know what to work on. We know what to, to help someone be able to do if there's some kind of change in their job or job description or opportunities are there to give an honest and accurate assessment of what that potential and those capabilities are. Yeah, yeah, and Maddie, Maddie, Maddie mentioned right um, that the test is difficult, um, and that there are components that are difficult for her to do, and that you know, in in some ways, uh, might be frustrating for Maddie, and I'm sure many other stroke survivors out there as well. Uh, but in other ways, it's important for a test, like you said, Steve, uh, to to not be too easy. You have to, um, you don't want the ceiling effect. This, this, uh, uh, where, where everyone gets a perfect score and you're not really sure how, um, how much, uh, function someone, someone has, um, and, and you want to make sure that your test both scales to those that can do very little, uh, while also being able to assess those that have maybe more function and more complex function. Sometimes what I struggle with is if I do a test like the Wolf motor function and say there's a one of the things is a little bit harder for me, like picking up the can is kind of hard. And there was a time where I couldn't really do the lifting up the, the basket one that's right at the end of the test. And um, sometimes I struggle with, okay, like I know that these things are hard for me, but what should I be working on in order to get to a point where I can do it? And like- So, the, so, so I'm hoping, I mean, I, 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 the, the answer to your question, should be that based upon um, a clinician's examination of your performance should enable them, because the, every one of these tests are written out very specifically for any clinician to read so they know exactly what we're trying to measure. They should be able to see two, two, two obvious questions. Can you do it or can't you? If you can do it, how long does it take? If it takes a long period of time, what do we need to work on for that particular task in order for you to do it faster? And, and what are the movement components? So you might be able to pick up a can, but you can't stack checkers because you don't have the fine control yes. for small That's movements, but you have the fine control to pick up a can. So that informs the therapist that they've got to work in, in, on smaller objects and working on your control and thinking about strategies for how you can do something. I, I, I can't speak to what other therapists do. I can tell you that in our clinic, what we try not to do is to tell a patient how to do something. But I feel and, like there's a difference between like how fast you can do it and then the quality of the Yes. Movement. And that's, I think, what can be hard because like sometimes I can do the task and you know it's really fast, but it doesn't necessarily like look as good yeah. as I would like it to. So kind of finding that balance is something that's a little challenging. Yeah, maybe maybe talk about that a little bit, Steve. So uh, if this is this is a time test, right? Uh, why yeah. not give all the time in the world? You know, why <laughs> why have that timer? And you know, I, I think that we want we want our guests to also uh, or our, our audience to also because I'm sure the timer is very frustrating for people. Man, if you just gave me a little bit more time, I could have done this. Well, we think that given the fact that there are 15 time test tasks, that to exceed two minutes 
is a reasonable amount of time to, to try to succeed. And if we allow this to go on for an indefinite period of time, and it builds frustration on the part of the patient, yeah. then they're not going to be prepared psychologically and physically right. to do the next task. So we have to put limits on this. And that's the only fair way in which to do it. Um, yeah. and, and to go back to the training part, what we try to encourage therapists to, to do in their interactions with their patients is not to tell them what to do, but to continuously ask one question after another that makes the patient probe and, and, dis, and discover. For example, if I was working with Maddie and she was having difficulty um, um, picking up small objects or even turning the key. Stacking the checkers. Stacking the checkers. I would say, well, well, what do you think you have to do? And your response probably might be, I don't know. Well, how would you find out? You know, and Good question. So, well, I, I don't know. Is there any way you could do it? Well, if I use my better hand, I could. Uh -huh. well, go ahead and use your better hand. So w what are you doing with your better hand? Hmm. These are continuous, we call them probes. Because the more you can begin to match and figure out, the more we're driving plasticity in your brain. Absolutely. And if we just show you and do it over and over with you, that's not creating changes that might be long lasting. Right. So we're continuously challenging you, the patient, to figure out. Of course, we don't want to frustrate people, but there's something that's quite magical about you, you, Figuring out, well, you know, maybe if I position my arm this way, it opens my hand a little bit more, and I'm able to show, get better grasp, as opposed to keeping my arm in another position. That element of self-discovery is very important in retraining your brain. And it's, we believe the more the patient can discover it, rather than us telling them what to do, the more long-lasting and effective it's going to be. Does that make sense to you? That makes sense, definitely. Yeah. You just don't say, oh, try over and over and over. You've got yeah. to explore. You've got to think about ways in which you can do something. And sometimes the answer lies in looking at how you do it with your better hand and then trying to compare that. You know, no, did, certainly. if I can divert for just one minute, we did a project for several years ago. I want you to picture uh, a box with two openings in it. And inside each box, maybe the, the sides are about a foot high, are mirrors. And what we would have a patient do is put their bad arm, but bad hand in, in one of the two boxes and cover the top of the box so they couldn't see it. And then we would have them do the movement with their good arm, but look at the mirror inside that box. Which like of course, therapy. It cre cre yes, it creates a mirror image. And we ask the patient without seeing what they're doing with their more their involved hand arm to, to do the movement that they're seeing their good arm do and try to do it with their bad arm, but we don't let them see what they're doing. We look at it, but they can't see it. Can we engage what we call these mirror neurons to make these things start to work? Just by looking at the mirror image and thinking that you're actually moving your impaired hand. And we've, had, we've published several papers demonstrating that, that can be very effective. But it takes time. It takes time. And how does it work? We don't know for sure. <laughs> well, we don't know. A lot of things with the brain, um, certainly. Uh... I can tell you something after many years um, when I actually see patients yeah. who, who can now do something they couldn't do before during their training. And and I watch them try to do the movement. Very often, they're not even aware of this. As they're trying to do the movement with their bad hand, they're actually making movements Same with their way. good hand that are very much have the elements that are involved in trying to do the task. And I ask them, do you, do you know what you're doing? And they'll, they'll tell me eventually, I know I'm doing this with my good hand, because it gives me a sense of what I have to do. And sometimes you gotta wonder whether that is their own, its own mirror, but we've never told the patient to do that. 
they, they kind of figure it out themselves. They, they inherently begin to learn to copy the movement with their better hand that they're trying to do with a more impaired one. That's very cool. And, and are, are some of those, some of the elements that led up to the inspiration for um, looking at, at these mirror types of, of therapies that, um, that uh, these studies that, that you had mentioned earlier with boxes? How, are the studies led up to that? Uh, no, the, ago, I mean, many yeah. people have done these kinds of things, but we did this. My, my background to get to where we are in the training that we do goes back to the days in which we were actually monitoring muscles something called EMG, where you can put sensors on muscles yeah. and get a visual picture of the, mu of the muscle activity. And in fact, um, just like uh, the hand mentor, you see video that changes based upon the amount of movement you're demonstrating at the wrist joint. We had very simple back then lines that go up and down that are related not to the movement, but to the muscle activity. And we would train people to increase their muscle activity appropriately. And that's um, either to increase it if it was the weak muscle or to relax it if it was the spastic or hyperactive muscle. And from that, we um, learned who, who, who has had a chronic stroke. That means more than six months since the time of their stroke. Who can learn to do this with this EMG biofeedback, this feedback of muscle activity in the form of sounds or pictures, a visualization. And it turns out the people who could do it the best are folks who could begin to straighten out their elbow, begin to raise their wrist up, and begin to open up their hand. And I don't know if you've heard of this concept of constraint-induced movement therapy, forcing mm -hmm. someone to use. That's how the criteria for constraint-induced movement therapy were born from our EMG biofeedback study. We call it originally forced use, forcing the patient to use their impaired limb by immobilizing the better limb and adding some behavioral components. Uh, Edward Taub, my colleague at the University of Alabama, Birmingham, renamed it appropriately constraint induced movement therapy. So, all of this stuff is tied together. It's not like you know, crazy things just happen. It's a history here. It goes back, geez, almost 35 <laughs> or 40 years Dr. now. Wolf, I and longer than you've been alive. I went to the Taub <laughs> Clinic. Did yeah, you? Yeah, that... so it was so great. Good. That's where Maddie, yeah, did did uh, uh, your rehab or some of your rehab, right? Is that right, Maddie? Uh, at the outpatient clinic there, you did um, constraint induced movement yes. therapy. And I've had outpatient therapists who have who have followed your research and the research of Dr. Taub and made modified programs for me in an outpatient setting too. So, oh, great, very good. That's fantastic. And Steve, you know, um, I know we, in the chat, in, in the past, we've had a chance to chat a little bit about um, the, uh, uh, your, you know, your involvement with the constrained use movement therapy and, and the trials that, um, that you had uh, conducted. I hope that, you know, we can also kind of, I know we looked at the trials themselves, but um, maybe we can also examine um, a little bit like today, kind of the, the, um, the, how, what led up to how, how you, you and, and, um, uh, your colleague, uh, Dr. Taub, okay. and this, yeah, uh, uh, work towards, you know, this is something that, that um, uh, we want to do a big trial in and, and um, really look at the, the effects of and how did you decide how many hours a day to do and, and all of these other factors. I'm sure there's a lot of thinking that went into um, and not only the hours, um, but what activities um, uh, were, were part of that, that, that uh, the, the constrained movement therapy. Um, and certainly today we talked about kind of, you know, what, um, what inclusion criteria led up to how, um, for, for whom um, maybe would be included in the study. But certainly a lot, that would be a lot to talk, to talk about, uh, maybe another, another show, another time. Uh, we have a, yeah. a few questions I, I'd like to, uh, uh, to get to as well here. Um, uh, we have one from Elizabeth and Rob. Um, can, uh, can we talk about, explain how the hand mentor benefits the fine motor skills in the fingers? Okay, so th that's a great question. Um, uh, fine motor skill is, is of course, uh, very important, like we discussed earlier, to turning that key in a lot of these functional tasks. And uh, maybe later on, uh, we'll have, uh, we'll be showing off, uh, we'll have Maddie with us demonstrating how she puts on her hand mentor and we'll be able to talk about kind of some of the exercises 
uh, that that uh, the hand mentor does, or she, Maddie does on the hand mentor for some of those fine motor skills. But certainly something, you know, uh, uh, strength, um, endurance, and, and of course, fine control, um, really important to a lot of functional tasks. Very good. Uh, so Steve, um, any, you know, uh, Last words about the the Wolf Motor Function Test. I, I know that uh, that uh, you know originally, like you said, it was called the the Emory. Uh, mm -hmm. I think the Emory Motor Function Test from Emory, Emory Assessment motor, it was Emory Motor Test. Emory Motor we, Test, we, and we never we never call it a test of function, Doctor Talbot. It was a motor assessment, a movement assessment. That's what was intended. Movement assessment. That's right. That's right. The tasks, uh, and then sir, I think we can say that the tasks that go into it have functional relevance to them. Hmm. You need to be able to do those things to have have function to be able to explore the environment. You have to be able to control all of these right. things. But um, it was, as I said, initially intended to look at all the segments of the joints and put the whole thing together to make decisions about what people could and could not do, what parts of their upper extremity rehab required, uh, limitations required further rehab, and to try to demonstrate improvement. And the most important question that are, are asked of clinicians by third party payers and by patients and patient families is, well, if, what, what can, will I be able to do that I can't do before? Right. Or can do better than I could do before. And we need to be able to answer that question in order to justify more treatment for our patients. That's simply a, a reality and it's a fair question to ask. So- Will there yeah. ever be another Wolf Motor Assessment? <laughs> <laughs> like a well, you know, so what some people have done, Maddie, they've taken the first four or five tasks and have called it a modified wolf motor function test because that's the one that just includes the elbow and yeah. the um, the wrist, uh, the elbow and the shoulder. Level and, one. And we said from the outset that the, in order to complete the entire wolf motor function test successfully, you need to have some of these isolated movements. Right. That, and 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 it was really designed for folks who we would call mild to moderate stroke survivors. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's, if someone has no hand movement whatsoever, it seems in their, in their many, many months post stroke, it's highly unlikely that they're gonna be able to do those tasks with a wolf motor function test. So someone was asking a question online about the relationship between hand mentor training and dexterity of movements in the digits. I think that was the nature of the question. Yeah, and yeah. Right now, the hand mentor is, is designed to increase the mobility of the wrist joint and by association, the fingers as well. So that you're hoping that as you can increase control of the wrist and movements, especially out of the bent position and towards what we call extension or hand opening, wrist bringing your wrist up, that you gain some more mobility in your fingers that Absolutely. will allow um, uh, greater t uh, finite uh, movement and grasp and release. But the hand mentors that exist right now is not designed to look at isolated movements of individual joints in the hand. It's by association that one hopes that as you improve wrist movement, you improve finger movement as well. That's right. And, and that, that's why it's so important to, to, to do these um, uh, these these tasks as well for clinicians to best understand. Um, you know, are these changes in strength, increases in dexterity? Are these uh, changes actually able to lead to functional improvements, uh, functional uh, tasks that can be done by the stroke survivor? Because at the end of the day, right, it's not um, the degrees of range of motion um, your hand has. It's uh, whether or not you can turn that key, or whether or not you can fold that towel, and how much of your your um, independence in your life that um, we can, we can get back. So certainly really important to look at. Um, and, uh, uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wolf, Steve, for your, for your contribution. Um, it certainly helped, I think a lot of stroke survivors and a lot of clinicians better understand how to best, best treat their, their clients. That's thank what you, it's Dr. all about. It's, it's, it certainly um, helped me. Oh, that's, <laughs> that's nice to hear. It's, that's why we do it, Maggie. Yeah. And we're, and I should add that, um, I and many of my colleagues are working on other approaches right now. Um, and um, there's a very high level journal called Lancet. You know, we have the New England Journal of Medicine, we have um, uh, the journal called Stroke, and we have um, um, 
what else is the other um, the other big one? And and um, the Lancet is the British equivalent to our New England Journal of Medicine. And um, we are having a paper, we, a group of 12 different centers in the United States and the UK have just have finished a, a study that was accepted for publication and will be out within the next two weeks, showing a whole new approach for folks who are more severely impaired to try to re rewire their brains in a way that hasn't been done before. So I just want you to, and others to know, we continuously work on novel ways in which we could try to trick the nervous system into working better. And it, it, it's a challenge, as you might imagine, it's a big challenge. That's well, that's, that's, that's very cool, Steve. Uh, very, uh, thank you for um, that, you know, certainly all the work you put in. And, and if I understand correctly, you run one of these 12 centers that's involved in this, um, this publication, Lancet, is that correct? Yes. Um, as part of your your current uh, your current work, well, we'd love to have you back at some point to to to, to chat about that. Um, that. I'm sure that that will be extremely exciting as well. Um, and uh, uh, you know, we're always always happy for you to to chat both on you know your your uh, uh, quite full history um, uh, with uh, uh, stroke rehab and and um, all the the various kind of uh, uh, the journeys that that and all the advances that. Uh, we've made in the past few decades um, in, in stroke rehab from, from you and, and your colleagues. And certainly for that, we, we have a lot to thank uh, for your contributions and um, among, among those, and of course, all your contributions to the hand mentor as well um, and the science behind it. Um, so that, you know, for all of our users, you know, you're all benefiting from, from all of the research that, that Steve has um, done here. And uh, we, we, for that, we thank you very much. Oh, my pleasure. <laughs> thank so, you. So you want me to stick around for a while or would you like me to leave? Or? Yeah, so well, feel free to stick around, Steve. Um, so I think next we're going to uh, we'll, um, go to Maddie here. We're going to have a, uh, she's going to show us how she puts on the hand mentor. We have a lot of questions from our users um, about what's the best way to put on the hand mentor, maybe some alternate, alter, alternative ways. Um, and so Maddie's had the hand mentor for, I think, uh, six, seven months now. Is that right, Maddie? Um, yeah, I think I've been, I've been starting it since June of last year, so. Okay, yeah, yeah, um, that's, whew, uh, what, eight, eight or nine months, um, and I, I know you took a little break recently to um, uh, drop down uh, to the, was it the Virgin Islands? Yes, the, the British Virgin <laughs> The so British Virgin Vir break, but. You know, I did other types of therapy, like I swam in the ocean. I'd never done that before since my injury. So That's still incredible. finding creative ways to engage my left side. Yeah, and we saw the you you post your videos about doing your exercises uh, while while you were out there. So uh, always great to you know looking for ways to to do rehab no matter where you are. Very good. Uh, but right before we get to that, Maddie, we have a few questions. And, and Steve, feel free to stick around. Um, but, you know, thank you for your time. Well, we certainly I, appreciate I, it. I leave in the world, I'm not being rude. I just <laughs> No, no, absolutely. Have to, have to. Thank you for joining us. Um, sure. And we'll, we'll have to have you back. And, um, you know, always love these discussions. Okay, uh, so, okay. Sure. Dr. Wolf. Good luck, Maddie. Thank you so much. Okay, so we have a question here here from, from Bob in the chat. Uh, Bob, how do you define a repetition in the MODIS reports? So that's a great question, Bob. So, mm -hmm. you know, um, there's a lot of ways to define repetition, uh, but, you know, we've gone through with our engineers and looking at the, the movement data that we get off of the, the hand mentor, the foot mentor, we define uh, a repetition as um, an activity dependent uh, as either two or three sign changes of velocity and movement. So what, what, is that, what does that really mean? Um, so sign changes in velocity. So here we're going into extension, here we're going to flexion. Um, and when we, when we shift from going extension into flexion or from flexion back into extension, that's a sign change. Um, the direction of the movement has changed. So either two or three sign changes. So if we go up, back down, and then back up, uh, that would be two sign changes. Uh, and that's what we're defining as a repetition. So um, of course we have you know various kinds of repetitions. Some might be smaller in nature, some might be larger in nature. So if we think about the strongman game, um, you know, you're gonna you're gonna typically you're gonna move down to pick up the, the barbell, and then you're gonna move up to lift it above 
your head. And that's going to be one repetition. Uh, but then on some other games, for example, the fishing game, or the space shooter game, where you might be going back and forth very quickly between asteroids or, or the fishes moving up and down quickly. And you're trying to keep that fish reeling in that fish. And those are some kind of um, going back to Elizabeth and Rob's question. Those are some of the more fine motor function games uh, that, that we have um, where you're trying to follow a quickly moving object um, that those types of exercises, those games are going to have more repetition. So it's not always the same number of repetitions per game. It's really going to be dependent on how you're moving and uh, what kind of games that you're playing. So hopefully that kind of um, helps you, Bob, in, in answering your question about what, what kind of uh, what counts as a repetition um, in, in, your, in your reports. Very good. And any, anything you want to add to that, Maddie? Um, uh, any, any, what, what are your favorite games or um, wh which games do you go to for repetitions? So my favorite is Space Shooter, which I'm sure is a <laughs> lot of people's favorite. I love that game. Um, it's a classic. Yeah, it's a classic. I like, I like, I prefer the games where it's kind of going side to side as opposed to like up and down, um, if that okay. makes and there's certain games, like I think it's the Sphero, for instance, which is a little hard because it's that's like kind of what you're saying about the rotational thing. It's more like the angle at which it turns as opposed to just like up and down or side to side, which I personally don't like as much. But hmm. I understand that's also an important thing to do. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, uh, that's an interesting thing. You know, certainly I think out of every game that we have, uh, we'll get some comments where this is the, the best game, the most fun game. I love playing uh, slot machine. I love playing fishing. And then it, it's not even the next day. You know, sometimes uh, we'll talk to uh, another one of our users um, later in the day and they'll ask, oh, you know, get, get fishing off of my, 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 uh, my list. I, I can't stand fishing or it's, you know, or, or that and it could be it's with every game. So I think that really goes to show um, to, our, to our game designers um, uh, so the challenge that they have to go to uh, sometimes to, to get the games that, that people want to play. Uh, but certainly, you know, please let us know. We always love feedback about what kind of games you want to see, uh, what game kind of games that we can add. Really, and whatever we can do, uh, like, like C said, you know, we're at your service. Whatever we can do to help get more repetitions, um, that's, that's what, uh, that's, you know, that's really our, what, what we, uh, our goal at the end of the day. So. Uh, please let us help you and, and let us know what you like. Uh, very good. So, okay. So Maddie, now uh, uh, we have a, a, a session with you uh, about how to put on the hand mentor. So where, where do you want to start? Oh, sure. Yeah. Let me, I'm just going to flip my camera over here around so I can show everyone here as well. So the hand mentor is definitely, you're able to put it on. This is what it looks like. You can definitely put it on if you only have really use of one hand and I do it on my own every single day and it took me a little bit of practice but it's actually not too challenging so first you have this like um can you see this little like a uh, pad thing that comes down from your hand mentor so I always make sure when I start that that is off completely and then I'm good I'm left side affected so I use my right hand to kind of pick it up and I start to like put my hand on this pad right here and it needs to be adjusted. Once I kind of get it on, then I stretch with my right hand, I'll stretch my fingers to be down and then flip the Velcro pad over. And then I strap it in nice and tight. Um, sorry, there we go. So then this part is done and you have this second strap, this black one that goes kind of around. So then with my unaffected hand, I, I, well, I'm straightening out my arm and then I strap it in these black straps and then it's on. It's actually, I mean, it took, a, it took me a little bit of practice to be able to do it, but, you know, after I put it on hundreds of times now, so now I can do it nice and easy, but it uh, 
definitely took a little bit of practice, but it is something that you can do even if you don't have any use of your one arm. So yeah, you were you were able to put it on right there, um, just using your your right side, um, and and that's uh, really part of you know that's certainly an engineering challenge I think with the original design of the hand mentor, how um, how would we be able to design a device that uh, we can have someone put on with just uh, one side, uh, with either the left or the right arm, uh, because many stroke survivors have difficulty with uh, movement on one side. And uh, we didn't want that to be a limiting factor in um, putting on the hand mentor or, or the foot mentor in that case. Um, you know, it, it's something certainly different if it can be put on independently rather than you having to wait for someone to, uh, who, who can help you put it on in order to start, start your rehab every day. So it, that took you, how long does it typically take you? Um, to put it on? To, to put on hand, yeah, to put on the hand mentor maybe yeah how long does how long does it typically take sorry i didn't quite oh sorry maybe you didn't hear me like probably about like 20 to 30 seconds i'm pretty fast okay right now. <laughs> <laughs> so so uh what what do you think how long do you think it took you maybe the first few times this is back you're gonna have to think back in yes. back in june or july yeah but it's one of those things kind of like what we've been talking about this entire time. Like the more you practice it, the better you'll get, the easier it will be. And, you know, now, like I said, now I can put it on in 20 seconds. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and, you know, it really goes back to what I think what, what we talked about with Steve, where uh, the brain is an incredible, incredible machine, uh, incredible organ where learn it learns and very can rewire to to make things um, that were once difficult much, much more easily. Uh, so, okay, so how, uh, we have a question here from, from Elizabeth, um, and maybe we can show this on, on your hand, or I'm gonna grab one here. How far forward do the fingers have to be on the hand mentor? Ooh, that's a good question. That's a good question. Maybe you wanna demonstrate here, Maddie? I've, I've got one here as well, if you want to refer to. Yeah, so I, my problem sometimes with the hand mentor is these little, um, like right at the bottom, you see this like black thing, like mine always ends up shifting down, if that makes sense. And so I have to constantly be adjusting that. Yeah, yeah. But, and, and these are to adjust the, how far the distance yeah. um, here, I can loosen mine here. So you, you have to move yours, Maddie. Um, how far down kind of this pad is. And that's really going to be uh, accommodating different hand sizes. So it's really the distance here um, between my wrist and the tips of my fingers. Uh, and for, for someone with, um, you know, a longer hand or a larger hand, we're gonna have to move that pad down further in order to accommodate the hand versus someone that might have a smaller hand. Um, so, I put my fingers up pretty far in it, to be honest. I don't know if you, can you really see? Um, yeah, yeah. And your fingers are, are sticking out a little bit there. And really the, the most important thing I think here, um, I'm gonna see, make sure I get this on the video, um, is to have your wrist here aligned correctly uh, with kind of this nub right here. We wanna make sure that your wrist is aligned there because that's that's where that movement's gonna be. And we want that, that center of that axis of rotation to be correct. Um, otherwise for the finger pad, this finger pad right here, we kind of want to move it so that it kind of rests on um, the, the palm of our hand, right into kind of um, the, the, the uh, web here of, of our hand. So that our fingers are really well supported. And, and it's gonna be for you know comfort as well, but you kind of want to have, I don't know if I can get the camera here correct, but you kind of want to have um, this pad all the way down um, so that your palm and your fingers are, are supported in your movement. So when we're opening up here, we are kind of opening up our hand as we, we move into extension, uh, extension as well. So hopefully Elizabeth, that kind of can help you um, with, with your, your donning process. Um, that's something we, we call donning and doffing. Um, often in studies uh, or in these clinical trials, we'll say donning and doffing, but really it's just a fancy way of saying 
um, putting something on or taking something off. In this case, the hand mentor. Very good. So, so uh, uh, Maddie, maybe maybe for those that that um, kind of um, you've been you've you know you've been on Ria Power Hour a couple of times here, I think. Uh, for those that that aren't so familiar, maybe tell us a little bit about your your stroke and um, and kind of your your journey so far as well. Uh, maybe we can start with you know um, how long ago was your stroke? Yeah, so I had a hemorrhagic stroke in May 2017. So it'll be four years ago on May 30th of this year, and basically. It was interesting because I had gone into, I just graduated from college actually. And I had this plan, I was gonna move up to Boston, start this new job. But before I was going to do that, I was going to have an elective brain surgery because I had an AVM in the right occipital lobe. And I knew about that because I'd gotten terrible migraines since I was a child. Um, culminating in a migraine lasting 24 days. And that's when I finally ended up getting scanned. They found this thing in my brain. And then the question became, what do we do about it? So after many consultations with many neurosurgeons, eventually I decided to get surgery after I, um, excuse me, graduated from college because I didn't like the idea of having a ticking time bomb in my head. So <laughs> I went in for the surgery my AVM was so big that they had to do an embolization and an angiogram to kind of shrink it down. So it was small enough for the um, doctor to operate on. And from the preoperative procedures, I got a blood clot, which burst, causing me to have a massive stroke. Thank God I was in the hospital. I was rushed into an emergency surgery, had like seven and a half liters of blood transfusion. Wow. And it was like a 10 hour surgery. I wake up after a coma and I'm completely paralyzed on the left side. So everything, like my arm, my leg, my face, um, like my speech, I couldn't really talk. So I began an extensive, intense period of rehab in both the inpatient and outpatient setting and, you know, relearning everything that I just used to take for granted, walking, using my hand and I'm left-handed. So uh, that's why it matters to me even more that I get my left side back because it's my dominant side. Um, but yeah, so I've worked really hard since then on, on my therapies. Um, I'm not doing cognitive yeah. speech anymore or actually I'm not at the moment going into PT and OT, but I kind of go in rounds, you know, like I'll do like a bout of therapy for a couple months or whatever now. Um, but I was in all of those therapies three days a week for um, a year and a half of my life. And then it started kind of like alternating because I also started working full time at that point. So, you know, yeah. kind of realizing how to, how I want to prioritize all the like hundreds of things in my life that I want to do. And I realized maybe it's time I take a little bit of a break from just rehab 24 seven and shift to other things like I wrote a book. Uh, I wrote two books actually. Um, and, you know, working and trying to test myself in these other capacities that were important to me. So. Yeah. That's fantastic. Yeah. And, and um, you know, you, you've certainly had quite the journey here um, and, and seven liters of blood, seven and a half liters, was it? Yeah. It was, seven and a half. That's all. That's, <laughs> that's a lot of blood considering most people have about five liters of blood. <laughs> Uh, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, getting a transfusion. I lost. <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, right, right. Um, yeah, uh, a transfusion for seven liters uh, basically means that you've lost that much blood. So that's that's quite um, that would have been quite the 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 surgery and the operation there, um, and and certainly um, you know you, you had had a hemorrhagic stroke, so um, uh, a bleed was certainly involved there, um, and uh, it, it seems like there you know the blood vessels that that infuse that that um, support the brain um, certainly they have they can have a lot of volume um, and it's important that we keep our our brain well in view, um, uh, uh, well oxygenated I should say uh, maybe um, and uh, uh, that unfortunately when blood vessels burst um, that can also have the effect of um, certainly a lot of um, a lot of blood and that and blood outside of blood vessels in the brain um, definitely not good um, um, can do a lot of damage to the brain and 
and for hemorrhagic stroke, certainly that's um, that's that's something that um, a lot of our stroke survivors that we have, and many stroke survivors all around the world are are recovering from. So you you said that right after your stroke, you had um, you know you were coming out of a coma, I think it was, and had very little movement and speech. So how how quickly did some of those things, or maybe how slowly did some of those things start coming back for you? Was it something where, you know, in the first few days there was a lot of gains or was it something that, you know, that took weeks or months for you to kind of see some of those, those back? Cause right, right now, right. Your, your speech is, is fantastic. And you've made quite a big journey. The speech that all came back pretty quickly, but like it definitely took a couple of weeks, like learning how to swallow, you know, like, yeah eat and talk and all that stuff took a couple of weeks what took way longer for me was the physical things like learning to walk doing things with my arm and my hand that stuff was all a lot slower to come back for me more so my arm than my leg but all of that was much slower for me than the cognitive things and the speech so in that sense I guess I was lucky yeah yeah, absolutely. Um, and you, uh, you did inpatient rehab probably for um, maybe a couple months, was it? Or may maybe a few weeks, depending on how long you stayed in the hospital. Yeah, I was 15 days in the ICU. And then I was like two months basically in inpatient and then a year and a half outpatient. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, so uh, certainly in inpatient, you were getting a lot more rehab, right? Uh, typically a lot of, you know, a lot of people, a lot of users, a lot of stroke survivors, um, they'll get something like two or three hours a day of rehab. Um, does that kind of match what, what you had in, in inpatient? Definitely. So, um, you know, and we, we always talk about how more hours, uh, more repetitions, that's really what drives the neuroplasticity, the recovery. Uh, the brain having to have lots of practice, lots of repetitions in order to uh, make those new connections to, to rewire around um, uh, maybe some some injuries or some some bro previously broken connections. Um, and getting that two or three hours a day equates to something like 10, 15 hours a week. Um, but then when you went home and you shifted to, to outpatient, how many sessions do you think you were doing um, every every week. Yeah, I was going into outpatient therapy two to three days a week. And that would be, you know, one, one to two hours, depending when I was doing cognitive, it would be longer. So okay. it would be like a full day, like six hours or something. But wow. Yeah. Yeah. So one or two hours a day. So um, that and that's always a, you know, that's something we see a lot um, with with a lot of stroke survivors while in the hospital they're getting something like 10, 15 hours a week. And then um, they go to outpatient, they go home. Um, it's always great to go home, right? No one wants to stay in the hospital, but at the same time, you know, while in the hospital, you have all these experts, all these clinicians kind of um, at your beck and call. They're, they're, they're coming to see you all the time. You're not having to go anywhere. Um, but then once you go home, um, there's kind of this inverse relationship with um, having, you know, uh, not having to, be stuck in a hospital, but also getting, having a much more limited access to rehab and going from kind of um, two or three hours a day, sometimes to two or three hours a week. Um, and, and that, that, okay. that drop off being, um, and you know, we know that more hours lead to more recovery as well as more repetitions. Um, and that uh, kind of, when people go home, um, kind of strangely with getting less rehab, a lot of their progress slows down. Um, and so, so there's um, kind of this thinking that all the gains that you're going to make from stroke, well, I should say some people say, right. Um, uh, we've heard this from some uh, users. We even hear this from some clinicians. Um, and this is just from their experience. All of the gains you're going to get from uh, recovering from the stroke are going to be made in the first few weeks and first few months, uh, right after your injury. Um, but that's also when you're getting the, all that rehab. Um, once you leave the hospital and you get a lot less rehab, it does make sense that 
a lot of um, recovery journeys slow down there as well. And and certainly, Maddie, in, in your case, and, and many other, you know, a lot of the other stroke survivors that we know that we encounter, several years after the stroke, they don't stop working at it. They keep um, going and getting their rehab. And it's not always the same type, and they're not always going to COT and PT. Um, sometimes they have modified programs. For you, you've uh, gotten a lot of hours of rehab on, on the hand mentor. And, and that's really um, kind of uh, made up for um, the, the lost hours that, uh, you, you know, that, um, that loss when you go home and the limited hours that you have of rehab, um, having those more hours uh, over, over time has, has continued to give you gains and continues to, to give you recovery. So um, I know that, that uh, you know, with some of our, our previous guests, we talk about how many hours that they have on the hand mentor. So Maddie, how many, how many hours are you at on, on your hand at mentor? At least 230. 230 hours. So that's, that's quite something. I don't know if Heather um, is, is with us today. Um, she's, uh, um, I think, been uh, a, a rock star from a recent, um, a recent rehab power. She's, she might be coming after you, Maddie. She's, she's doing uh, from, if I can recall, she said she was well, Nick, Dr. Nick had asked, um, how, so how many hours are you doing through two or three hours a day? And her response was, no, I'm doing five hours a day, six days a week. So that is, that is quite a pace that, that she is setting. Lot. Wow. That is amazing. And, and, you know, to, to everyone out there, um, uh, don't, it, it don't feel like you have to, you know, it, it's going to be different for everyone. Um, exactly. We have, I think we had somebody, um, a guest from last power hour that, um, that was doing something like 45 minutes a day and they were looking to get to an hour and, but at 45 minutes, they were feeling fatigue and they were feeling, you know, really feeling that the exercises, um, but, and that's okay. That's okay. You know, that's that feeling that fatigue, feeling that exercise, uh, feeling the, the pain, as we say, um, some pain, I should say. That's uh, that's means you're working out. That means you're working hard. Um, we don't want too much pain. That's always you know something that Dr. Nick talks about. Um, but you know over time you you will start at uh, 30 minutes, 40 minutes, and we see a lot of stroke survivors able to work um, into those higher numbers uh, as they build their endurance, as they build their their rehab. So um, so yeah, what uh, what how how what what did you start with maddie um, i know that that you you've worked with dr nick for some time now as well how how long did you start off with some of your first sessions so in the beginning i remember i actually remember the very first time i used the hand mentor i had a session for like 80 minutes or whatever i could only do 10 before i had to take a break and i really really had to build up my stamina and my endurance to a point where i was able to do longer workouts and get to 30 minutes in one sitting 60 minutes in one sitting so it just took a lot of a lot of time to get to that point so I absolutely anyone listening like any workout is a good workout like even if you only do five minutes or 20 minutes like that's amazing and don't don't ever beat yourself up about like oh I can't do because I used to do that to be like I cannot do a full 60 minute session but you know what that's okay. Absolutely. Absolutely. And no, that's a, that's a fantastic message that even a five minute workout, you know, whatever you can put in, um, that's that analogy we use, you're making a deposit, um, into, into, uh, um, this bank account that your, your brain account, brain. if you will. <laughs> and, um, you know, over time, um, and, and like, like Stacy has said here in the chat, let's prove those doctors and therapists wrong. You know, um, you know, we, we have people that say, um, you know, oh, so and so is not going to make much more gains. So and so's, um, you know, we, we, I, I see a lot of patients. I see patients all the time, and and uh, for someone that's in this state, um, you know, the outcome is not so good. Uh, but you know, it's that's that's if you don't get rehab, of course you're not going to get better. Um, and and that's not to say that for every stroke survivor that if we just add more hours of rehab that, you know, you're definitely going to see, um, uh, you know, X, X rehab equals Y improvement. It, that, as we know, with every stroke, it's very difficult to say how everyone will react. But we, we do know that for a lot of our users, and I've seen a lot of stroke survivors personally as well, that um, several years after, after their stroke, they will surprise their therapists. They will go back to see the therapists that, that um, have, 
you know, made some preconceived guess as to where they're going to end up. Um, they'll, they'll go back and surprise their therapist after doing 20 hours, 50 hours, you know, even 10 hours on, on uh, some kind of a home exercise program or the hand mentor or the foot mentor. And um, they'll, su- they'll surprise their therapist as a, wow, like, uh, I didn't really expect you to, to, to be able to continue to make gains. And, um, you know, that's, that's all, you know, part of, part of it, I think, that you stay motivated to, to do your rehab. Very good. Uh, well, well, thank you to, uh, tonight, Maddie, for, for joining us. And, and thank you for showing us how you put on your hand mentor. Um, certainly uh, such an inspiring story to hear from you, I think, uh, for a lot of our viewers that, um, you, you know, you uh, having had such a serious stroke, such, such a serious injury um, and, and your journey over the years and uh, all the recovery that you made and that you're still today um, you know, years later, so very motivated to keep to keep going, um, as well as to keep living your life as well, because that's, you know, that's super important um, to, to any stroke survivors. That's the ultimate goal to get you back to your life um, and to get back you to the activities that, that you enjoy. So uh, for everyone out there, uh, please follow Maddie. Matt, uh, Maddie, where can everyone find you at? You can find me on Instagram. It's Maddie Stroke of Luck, which is M-A-D-D-I Stroke of Luck. Um, if you, I'm, I'm friends with Modus Nova on Instagram, so you should be able to find me through that. Um, but yeah, that's probably the best place to contact me. I love connecting with you all and hearing your stories and answering any questions and just talking about our journeys. So definitely connect with me there. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, please reach out to Maddie on Instagram and, and, uh, 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 and, and Maddie, I, I think you do some live streams as well on, on Instagram. Is that right? Where, where can we find those? So I do with my podcast co-host weekly live streams Sundays at 5 p.m. Eastern. And um, we also interview other brain injury and stroke survivors and share their stories on our podcast. So obviously, if anyone would like to be interviewed or connect for that, please reach out to me. Um, yeah. That would be awesome. <laughs> fantastic, fantastic. Um, and we'll have to, uh, you know, we'll have to have you back. I think today we talked about putting on the hand mentor, but we'd love to also see your progress. I think we might have some videos from uh, <laughs> earlier in your in your your rehab process with the hand mentor. And um, you know, I'd love to to talk about kind of um, the the gains that you've made. Uh, maybe we can do a little bit of a teaser now, but. Um, uh, what, you know, have you made any gains with, with the hand mentor over the past eight months? I have. Yes. I guess um, and the, biggest, the biggest gain I've noticed has been reduced tone in my hands. Like that's been the biggest thing I've noticed and it's really impacted my life in a positive way. That's fantastic. Yeah. And, and for a lot of, a lot of, uh, uh stroke survivors, having that tone there, always there kind of prevents, um, a lot of uh, movement uh, from happening because you're kind of always in this position where you're you're in a closed position and and you can't open your hand enough to um, for it to be functional and so um, certainly um, beating back that tone I think um, and and learning to be able to open your hand and relax that's so important to a lot of functional elements of life well very good um, thank you thank you everyone for for joining us tonight. Um, uh, and, uh, I, we're running a little bit over tonight, but I, I hope everyone's had a, had a great time. Um, it was great to have, uh, Steve had Dr. Wolf on, um, you know, what we're, we're going to have him back. Um, uh, Dr. Wolf is, you know, such incredible researcher. He had such a, uh, a career in, in stroke rehab, having worked with some of the biggest names in, in, um, in stroke rehab. And, uh, I think, um, you know, we've had him on in the past as well with, um, and, and I think t- today when we were setting up for the show, uh, Maddie was like, oh, this, this is the Wolf Motor Function Test, uh, Dr. Wolf. And that, that kind of, I, 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 I heard that, that oh. click there. Uh, but, you know, we, that, it's, it's funny because, um, you know, we, we always refer to him as Dr. Wolf, uh, as to Steve. Um, but, yeah, um, many, uh, many, I think um, he's been the, the inventor for this test that many of, of the stroke survivors have taken. I've con- personally conducted the Wolf Motor Function Test many, many times, and um, certainly uh, a blast to, to have him on and and hear his perspective. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Well, very good. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Well, 
Um, thank you, Maddie, for, for coming on and we'll have to have you back as well. Um, thanks to everyone for joining us and uh, we're signing out tonight. Um, and remember, uh, always do your rehab. Uh, rehab hours equals recovery. Very good. Exactly. <laughs> good night. Good night.